My dear loving Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this beautiful Sabbath day that you've given us. You've called us apart to worship you today. Lord, we ask that you will accept our worship. Send the Holy Spirit to be with us in a very special way today. May the holy angels come and fill every empty seat, and may we know that we are worshiping in your very presence. Lord, bless our worship today and throughout this service. My prayer is that Jesus Christ will be lifted up here today. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I've been looking through the Bible at the word compassion. The Bible talks a lot about compassion. But what is compassion? The dictionary typically says that it's sympathy or pity. If Christian compassion is no more than sympathy or pity, it is unwanted. Try pitying your spouse. He or she will probably be offended. Pity your child and he'll probably become angry. Because pity kind of says, I am up here and coping with life, and it's just too bad that you're not quite as capable as I am, that you're not doing quite as well as I am. Pity is kind of a a pat on the top of the head. Pity is looking down mercifully, but nobody likes to be looked down on. What is Christian compassion? There's a long $20 Greek word that helps us to understand. The word is splonknizome. It's the word translated compassion in the New Testament. It's the same word that's used for viscera, for the internal organs. In fact, that's the root word for the word spleen, one of our internal organs. In other words, it is a gut feeling. It is feeling, a gut feeling, an inward feeling that includes affection and empathy. Christian compassion is feeling with. And that's the thought I want most to impress upon us this morning. Christian compassion is feeling with. Now let's divide that concept into two parts. First of all, Christian compassion is feeling. You see, emotion can be Christian. Christ was not afraid to feel. In fact, people turned him on. He could hardly seem to see a crowd without becoming emotionally involved. Christ was not afraid to feel. I invite you to open your Bible with me now to Matthew, Matthew, the ninth chapter. If you didn't bring a Bible to church today, there should be one on the hymnal rack in front of you. We'd appreciate it if everyone had a Bible open. We're learning that Jesus was not afraid to feel. Notice that Jesus had feeling for the lost. Matthew, the ninth chapter and the 36th verse, Matthew 9, 36. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Like lost sheep, Jesus saw the multitude before him, and he had compassion on the lost. If there is one lost man or woman, boy or girl, in this congregation this morning, the heart of Jesus flows out in compassion to you. Christ had compassion for the lost. Now turn over a little bit to Matthew, the 20th chapter. Matthew, the 20th chapter, he had feeling for the handicapped. Matthew 20, verses 29 through 34. And as they departed from Jericho, a great multitude followed him. And behold, two blind men sitting by the wayside, when they heard that Jesus passed by, 
cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. And the multitude rebuked them because they should hold their peace. But they cried the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. And Jesus stood still and called them. And he said, What will ye that I should do unto you? They say unto him, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. So Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. And immediately their eyes received sight and they followed him. Jesus had feeling for the handicap. Now turn to the next gospel, the gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 1. We find that Jesus had feeling for the unclean. Mark 1 verses 40 to 42. Mark 1, 40 to 42. And there came a leper to him, beseeching him, and kneeling down to him, and saying unto him, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus, moved with compassion, put forth his hand, and touched him, and saith unto him, I will be thou clean. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him, and he was cleansed. If there's any in this congregation today who come to church feeling unclean, feeling weighed down by sins in your life, the Lord Jesus is moved to cleanse you today. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now turn to Mark, the eighth chapter. Mark, the eighth chapter. Jesus had feeling for the hungry. Mark, chapter eight, the first two verses. In those days, the multitude being very great, and it tells later in the chapter, 4,000 men plus women and children, and having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples unto him and saith unto them, I have compassion on the multitude, because they have now been with me three days and have nothing to eat. Jesus had feeling for those who were hungry. And now turn to the next gospel, to Luke. Luke, the seventh chapter. Jesus had feeling for the bereaved. Luke 7 tells the story of the widow of Nain out to bury her boy. Luke 7, verses 12 to 15. Now when he had come nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And much people of the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said unto her, Weep not. And he came and he touched the bier, the coffin, and they that bare him stood still. And he said, Young man, I say unto thee, Arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak, and he delivered him to his mother. Jesus had compassion on the bereaved. Twelve times I find in the Gospels that Jesus reacted to a given situation with compassion. Jesus was enthusiastic. He could get very excited over his work. On one occasion, so much so that his friend said he is beside himself. Jesus was not afraid to feel. When Lazarus died, Jesus cried. When Jerusalem rejected salvation, Jesus wept. And if the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart this morning and you say no to him like Jerusalem did, it will hurt the heart of Jesus this morning because Jesus was not afraid to feel. 
Now that may be a little bit hard on those of us that have been raised to be Stoics, but the truth of the matter is to be afraid of feeling is not Christ-like because Jesus was not afraid to feel. The same was true of the early church. The early church was a feeling church. It was a noisy church sometimes, too. At the time of the triumphal entry, all of that noise and the commotion, all that they really needed was a marching band. That would have been perfect. There was tremendous, overwhelming enthusiasm. At the time of the triumphal entry, so much so that it terribly upset the leadership of the church. And they came to Jesus and said, why don't you just stop all of this clamor? And isn't it interesting that Jesus refused to interfere with that kind of worship? Surely there was feeling at Pentecost. The Bible says that there was a noise of a rushing mighty wind. The disciples were preaching and praising God. There was so much emotion that people came running. Maybe the reason more people don't come running to the church today is because there's not enough noise, because there's not enough enthusiasm. There's just not enough happening. As the story goes, the church caught on fire. It's a small town. It was a volunteer fire department. The preacher came running to help fight the fire. And lo and behold, so did the town atheist. And when things finally had cooled off a bit, the preacher turned to the atheist and he said, you know, this is the first time I've seen you at church. Yes, said the atheist. And this is the first time the church has ever been on fire. Brothers and sisters, that early Christian church was on fire. And when the church is on fire, people will come to see it burn. Now it's true that Christ reveals himself with a still small voice but he also comes with the earthquake and the wind and the fire. How unexciting it would be if Jesus came to everybody in just the same way. How foolish of me to presume that he must come to everybody the same way he came to my heart. Actually, this lack of feeling is not typical of Adventism. A fear of feeling is not typical of Adventism, only of contemporary Adventism. I sat years ago in an Adventist college auditorium in Texas. I have an idea that you've all had an experience something like this. There was a gospel group, the Blackwood Brothers, internationally known gospel group. They've been invited to the campus to perform for the College Lyceum Series, a series of cultural events, and they had a lot of big names that would come and perform, and so the surrounding communities would also be invited, but many of the people there were Adventists. It was an Adventist college town that was sponsoring the event. But as the Blackwood Brothers performed, and many of the people, especially coming from the other surrounding communities who were not Adventist, got a little more and more excited and kind of into the music. Until here and there throughout the audience, you would see people beginning to hold up a hand. And some people would hold up both hands and people would be very audible in their praise of God during the service. And over that predominantly Adventist audience, there fell a kind of a chilling, embarrassed silence because we get embarrassed by too much feeling. A young woman attended a prayer session. It was at her uncle's home. And in the process of praying together and worshiping together, she became so overwhelmed emotionally that she fell unconscious. She was, in fact, so overwrought that she dared not even go home that night. She had to spend the night there. A preacher was preaching, and the man on the platform behind him became so emotionally involved that he fainted. 
and the preacher turned just in time to grab him before his head hit the floor. And they laid him out there on the sofa behind the pulpit until the service, service was over. At another meeting, this same group of people, it came time to close and nobody wanted to leave. On and on, on and on, on and on until midnight came before they finally broke up. But hardly any could sleep because they were so emotionally involved. And so the next morning they came and they continued and that meeting never did end until 5 p.m. the following day. Those emotional meetings, was that some charismatic church? Those were early Adventist meetings. And who was that young woman who fainted? Some Jesus freak, some holy roller? That was Ellen White. See, many of the present leadership of the church grew up at a time when it was not very socially acceptable to show your feelings. What a tragedy if sociology changes our theology more than our theology changes our sociology. What I'm trying to say is that Christian compassion is feeling that emotion can be Christian. Jesus was not afraid to feel. The early church was an exciting, it was an emotional church, and so was early Adventism. The truth is, folks, that the church needs both reason and emotion. And neither should ever be divorced from true Christianity. Just as it would be wrong for us to have all emotion without any reason, it is equally wrong to emphasize all reason without any emotion. You want to go sailing, but you don't have a sail. All you have is a rudder on your sailboat. And so you paddle out a little ways, and you're ready now to sail. And so you, you take hold of that tiller that's back there that guides the rudder down below the water. You take a hold of that tiller, and you set your eyes straight ahead. And there you set in complete control absolutely dead in the water. Nothing's going wrong because nothing's going. Well, that's not the way to sail. This isn't any fun. And so you paddle your way back to shore and you trade the rudder in on a sail. Now something's going to happen. You get out into the wind and you hoist your sail and sure enough, the first gust comes along and gets you moving. And then you start skimming across the water faster and faster and faster. Now something's happening. Wham! Right into the first shore that gets in your way. What do you need to go sailing? Do you need a rudder or do you need a sail? Both. A rudder is logic, guides us. A sail is feeling. Which do we need to have a full Christian theology? Both. Don't you see, folks, God wants all there is of you. He wants the thinking person. He wants the feeling person because he wants all of you. Religion without feeling is dead and feeling without expression is sick. Could you think that through with me for a moment? Religion without feeling is dead. Only a thing that is dead has no feeling. If you were to ask Brother James today, who's going through a lot of pain, I talked with him last night after his knee replacement surgery, he would probably praise God because at least he has feeling. Everything that is alive has feeling. And if the church is alive, it will have feeling. Only a thing that is dead does not feel. And we all know that when you feel and you don't find some way to express that feeling, that can be very emotionally negative. And that's why I suggest so long as the church is alive, we must never be afraid to feel. And if we feel there must be some socially acceptable way among us in our worship tradition that allows some means of expressing that feeling, because feeling without expression is sick. 
And if it's too frightening for us to say amen or praise the Lord or hallelujah, maybe we better learn to clap our hands or cluck our tongues or rub our noses or do something. Because religion without expressing it is, religion without feeling is dead. And feeling without expression is sick. We're talking about compassion. We're saying, first of all, that compassion, Christian compassion, is feeling. And now let's take the second step. Christian compassion is feeling with. Feeling with. It is taking off my shoes and walking in somebody else's shoes. Just a few weeks we celebrate Christmas. What are we celebrating? We're celebrating Jesus taking off his crown, getting off of his throne, off the perfect environment of heaven, and coming down here to this earth to walk a mile in our shoes, feeling with, having compassion for sinners. Trying to to be sensitive enough to the needs and the problems and the cares and the hurts and the loves of others that I can feel with. Feeling with unites. Would you turn with me over, if you're still in the Gospel of Luke, over to Luke 15. Let's read just a few verses from that familiar story of the prodigal son. It's a story now of his having grown sick of the far country, And he's ready to come home, Luke, the 15th chapter, verses 17 to 20. And when he came to him, to himself, excuse me, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. And am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. The father's compassion reunited that family. The boy came back expecting to be at best only a hired hand, but the compassion of the father made him a son because compassion unites. Compassion unites families. Compassion unites parents and children. The next two verses, Luke 15, verses 21 and 22. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. The father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. The compassion of the father made him hide the boy's shame beneath the family robe. Nobody is going to see my boy's mistakes. The compassionate father hides the shame of his son instead of advertising the shame. Oh, how much we need compassionate fathers. I'm afraid I would have said, I told you so. Look what a mess you've made of things. Shame on you. Not a compassionate father. The compassionate father took off his coat and he covered the boy's shame. He didn't want anybody to see. I ran across this Confession of a father to his son. I don't know who wrote it, but it really spoke to me about my own regrets, my own experience as a father. I believe we can all identify with it to some degree, and so I want to share that with you today. The man writes, listen, son. I'm saying this to you as you lie asleep, one little paw crumpled under your cheek and the blonde curls stickily wet on your damp forehead. I've stolen into your room alone. Just a few minutes ago, as I sat reading my paper, a hot, stifling wave of remorse swept over me. 
I could not resist it. Guiltily, I came to your bedside. These are the things I was thinking, son. I had been cross to you. I scolded you as you were dressing for school because you gave your face merely a dab with a towel. I took you to task for not cleaning your shoes. I called out angrily when I found you had thrown some of your things on the floor. At breakfast, I found fault too. You spilled things. You gulped down your food. You put your elbows on the table. You spread butter too thick on your bread. As you started off to play and I left for work, you turned and waved your little hand and called, Goodbye, Daddy. And I frowned and said in reply, Hold your shoulders back, son. Then it began again late in the afternoon as I came up the road. I spotted you down on your knees playing marbles. There were holes in your jeans. I humiliated you before your friends by making you march ahead of me back to the house. Pants were expensive. If you had to buy them, you would be more careful. Imagine that, son, from a father. It was such stupid, silly logic. Do you remember later when I was reading in the living room how you came in softly, timidly, with a sort of a hurt look upon your face? And I glanced up over my paper, impatient at the interruption. You hesitated at the door. What is it you want? I snapped. You said nothing, but ran across in one tempestuous plunge and threw your arms around my neck and kissed me again and again. And your small arms tightened with an affection that God had set blooming in your heart and in which even neglect could not wither. And then you were gone, pattering up the stairs. Well, son, it was shortly afterward that my paper slipped from my hand and a terrible, sickening fear came over me. Suddenly I saw myself as I really was and all of my horrible selfishness, and I felt sick at heart. What has habit been doing to me? The habit of complaining, of finding fault, of reprimanding. All of these were my rewards to you for being a boy. It was not that I did not love you. It was that I expected so much of you. I was measuring you by the yardstick of my own years. And there was so much that was good and fine. I've come to your bedside in the darkness and have knelt there choking with emotion and so ashamed. It's a feeble atonement. I know you would not understand these things if I told them to you during your waking hours, and yet I must say what I am saying. And I have prayed God to strengthen me in my new resolve. Tomorrow I will be a real daddy. I will chum with you and suffer when you suffer. I will laugh when you laugh. I will bite my tongue when impatient words come. I will keep saying as if it were a ritual, he's nothing but a boy, a little boy. And I will do everything I can to let you know every day how much I love you. Feeling compassion unites parents and children. Feeling with unites husbands and wives. He comes home and he finds that she is irritable and cranky and he can't understand what's wrong with her. Must be one of her moods. He's not aware that she fixed her hair differently or put on a new dress or made something very special for supper. He was not able to feel. He did not have compassion. Or he comes home and he's silent and sullen and she can't even get two words out of him all evening and she begins to feel sorry for herself to have a husband like that. The truth is that things went wrong at work and he made a mistake or he was not promoted when he was expecting to be or for some reason he came home feeling like a failure and she never even knew because she had no compassion. Christian compassion unites Husbands and wives. Brother, sister, do you have Christian compassion? Are you able and willing to feel 
are you capable of feeling with? A man by the name of John Griffin wrote a most intriguing book entitled Black Like Me. Mr. Griffin had been writing a great deal on racial issues when it dawned on him one day that he didn't really have a clue what he was talking about because he didn't know how it felt to be a black in the deep segregation of the South. And he tried a most intriguing experiment in the fall of 1959, back when segregation was rampant, racial intolerance, prejudice. And he experimented for a while until he found a walnut stain that made his white skin dark. He cut off his straight hair. He left Texas and went to New Orleans as a black man. Up and down the street, he purchased things in the stores, and he was fairly well treated until he ran out of cash. But he had arranged for such an emergency. He had a whole wallet full of traveler's checks. Never, never as a white man had he had any trouble cashing a traveler's check. As good as money. But when he took it to a store as a black man, oh, we don't cash checks. Take it to the bank. The bank is closed. We don't cash checks. I have bought things from you before. We don't cash checks. Take it to the bank. I'd be willing to buy something from you now. Listen, we don't cash checks. And up and down the streets of that city he went, and he could not cash a check as a black man. So finally he came to the Catholic bookstore, and he was so appreciative that they would cash his check that he bought some books from them. And then he went down to the bus depot, and he asked for a ticket to Hattiesburg. He laid a $10 bill down on the counter. We don't have change. And he just left it laying there, and the clerk became angry that he would just leave it there. She said, I told you, we don't have change. Well, surely somebody can change a $10 bill. And finally, she grabbed it, and she disappeared, and she came back, and she flung the ticket and the money, the change on the counter, and it all went flying off onto the floor. With the ticket in his hand, he turned to sit down and wait for the bus. And he sat down and looked straight ahead, square into the hating eyes of a big white man. And he dare not sit down. The porter rescued him and took him outside around the corner to wait in the colored area. And he sat there all alone, and he said, suddenly, suddenly it happened. He said, for some time, I had looked black. But for the first time, I felt black. And then, and only then, he could write with compassion, feeling with feeling with. Brethren and sisters, this week in our families, let us learn Christian compassion. Parents, feeling with your children. Boys and girls, feeling with your parents. On the job, feeling with your co-workers. How about feeling with your neighbors, showing compassion to those around us? And here in our church family, feeling with compassion one to another. Jesus came 2,000 years ago to show the world compassion. I've just got one final text in closing that I want to present to you. Philippians 2, verses 1 and 2. Philippians 2. Verses 1 and 2, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, 
if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies. There's that word again, bowels. That's the same word that is translated compassion. Maybe in your version it is translated compassion. If any bowels, any compassion and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. And then down to verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Today, I want to have the mind of Christ Jesus. I would be like Jesus. Our dear, loving, compassionate Father, we are so grateful to be called your children and so grateful that we have such a wonderful Father who shows us what compassion really is. As we celebrate this holiday season, Jesus coming down, 2,000 years ago to this world. Help us to remember what Jesus came to show, compassion. To walk in our steps to experience cold, hunger, and loneliness. And so we know, Lord, that you understand what it's like to live here on this sinful, imperfect world. Lord, we want to be like Jesus. We want to have the mind of Christ Jesus. And Lord, I just pray that today the Holy Spirit will come into each heart, to each mind, that we will not be afraid to feel, to express our emotions and our feelings to one another and in our church body when we come to worship. Lord, unite us to the power of your Holy Spirit, to the power of compassionate love. Unite our families, parents with children and children with parents, husbands with wives. In our communities and here in our church family, Help us to be like Jesus, to love like Jesus, to feel like Jesus in the home and in the throng. May we be like Jesus all day long. Lord, we would be like Jesus. Is our prayer in his most loving and gracious name. Amen.